I'm going to be speaking this morning about um, coming free of our upbringing and past. So as we discussed in the introduction, we really look to encourage you how to be, um, how to be empowered, that you can empower your students as well to fully function in their full identity. So as I discussed in the introduction, often what happens is when we in our own lives haven't quite come into the fullness of our own identity, when we haven't fully embraced who we really are, often when there are dynamics of young children or youth or even adults that are dysfunctional, or going through difficult situations, often that triggers on our own value system, <laughs> our own sense of um, our personal value. And um, it's so important that we look at those aspects and, and just start to understand why sometimes uh, these children's dysfunction tend to cause a reaction in us as adults rather than us actually responding to them in a way that is going to be empowering, that is going to be affirming and that is going to build into their value system. And so that is what the seminar really is all about. It's um, coming alongside you as educators and principals and, and really helping you to understand uh, why the what these triggers are all about and um, and in that understanding uh, with knowledge um, enabling you to come free of those uh, areas of triggers and to fully function in who you really are so we're just going to be looking today first of all at um, how identity is established in, in young children. So God has basically designed mankind um, to be loved unconditionally. He's also designed, there's something in the heart of man that is really needing to, to belong. And so God put parents in the earth for that, for that function for children to grow up and to model the, after the parents. So there's a scripture in the Bible in 2 Corinthians 3 that says, all of us as with unveiled face behold him as in a mirror are being changed into his image and likeness. So basically what the scripture is talking about, it's talking about um, really reflecting the image and likeness of God and um, so so just like Gunter was sharing about Simba when he'd lost sight of who he was he actually fell to a lower identity and he couldn't quite come into his purpose he couldn't come into his identity and the, hence his authority and take up his rulership as king of Lion Rock. So actually the hyenas were ruling and he ran away, if you remember in the movie The Lion King, when um, Scar, who is so typical of um, circumstances that happen in our lives, Scar continued to set up circumstances uh, to trick and trap Simba into making wrong choices and then condemning him and causing him um, to feel guilty and ashamed and then when Simba looked to him for consolation his response was just run away just run away and isn't that just really how darkness works in our lives you know often we um, you know we, we end up because of the brokenness in our upbringing and our past we we are an open target often to darkness coming in and finding those vulnerable places in our heart, the places of woundedness and the places of um, 
deep hurts, places of um, inadequacy and really builds like a fortress <laughs> in those places and often people spend their lives covered in guilt and shame and, um, and blame. So just like Simba ran away from, he didn't recognize he was actually a king and he was meant to rule. And so he ran away from his um, purpose and he fell to a less identity. And so it was only when, I don't know if you remember, look, this is in a Christian movie, but it really is a wonderful picture about identity. So what happened is um, Rafiki the monkey, he came and he found Simba. He actually, I think he hit Simba on the head and he said to Simba, come, I'm taking you to um, a special place. And he took him to the waters that river of reflection and he got him to look into the river and Simba didn't see anything and he said look harder and then Simba looked into the water and then suddenly he saw the face of his father and he heard the voice of his father saying to him Simba you've forgotten who you are because you've forgotten who I am and he said, look inside of you, I live in you. And at that point, Simba recognized that he'd been listening to another voice, but he recognized that his father has been living in, in him all along. And he realized that he had identity and he was created to rule. And from that point, he had the confidence to go forward and to take up his position as ruler in his jurisdiction. And as he did, and he went up um, Lion Rock, he was able to face Scar, look him in the eyes. And often that look it in the eyes is often we need to go back to the place of the lies in our lives. And um, that's really what this seminar is about, is about facing those giants that are really lies, their voices from the past that over and over are looking for vulnerable places in our hearts, places where there's been lack, places where we have not been affirmed or validated in our true identity, and then try to break us down, to accuse us, to bring condemnation and shame, to cause us to fall to a lower identity, just like Simba did, and to run away from who he really was. And so the wonderful part of that story is when he realized he'd spent most of his um, youth running away from a lie, from a voice, from, a, from someone who, who from, it was really a, um, someone who couldn't rule but he had rulership, he had an authority. And when he recognized that, he could accept his identity as the son of the king and face the enemy, face those lies and the inadequacies and the insecurities, the inferiorities, the lies about his past. And to actually take hold of his true identity and in that he could step into his authority and when we step into authority, there's, there's always victory. And so he was able to go and walk up Lime Rock, up, up Pride Rock. And as he started to walk up Pride Rock, so if you remember clearly, everything was in darkness, everything was in ruin. But as he took those steps, as he took that step, faced that lie in the face, he was able to ascend up the mountain and he was able to um, take up his position of rulership and the higher he ascended, so everything around him in creation started to come into subjection, um, back into its normal state of being. Everything, the grass turned green, uh, the animals started to rejoice, they actually bowed down because they recognized his authority and so all of all of the lies in our lives, all of the darkness, all of the guilt and shame is broken 
when we recognize who we are and we step into our authority and we move forward into being who we are and yeah so so that really is a picture of um, the gospel really um, I think Gunter was talking about earlier how um, you know scars a picture of um, the devil and Mufasa was a picture of um, God and Simba really a picture of who we are as um, God's children we are really designed and made to rule and to take authority and to function in a position of royalty in the world and God is really calling right now um, people worldwide across culture whatever our beliefs our culture is to really take hold of who we are and to really understand that every one of us are God's children and that um, every one of us carry value and every one of us in our DNA, basically, we belong to God and we are created like Him in His image and likeness. So, just practically, how does that all work out? So, what happens is when children are born, there's something that God has put into the heart of a child that certain um, needs to to really be nurtured and to be um, affirmed in one's identity and so as a result God has um, given children parents and so the role of the parent is really the mother for instance she really builds into the emotional EQ the emotional so you have your intellectual intelligence which is really important but equally important, if not more, um, in fact they say the emotional intelligence is more important than the intellect, the, the um, EQ is more important than the RQ. And the reason for that is that um, is it just balances everything, the emotions, the emotional well-being of a child and of a person really it causes a person who is intellectual for them to have a sustainable life and so the mother actually builds into the infrastructure the nurturing heart of the child and she nurtures and really what she's doing in the um, formative years of the child is she's meeting the, the needs of that individual child she's um, each child has got a, a special set of needs and those needs it's very important for the child to have met but the most important need is unconditional love so God has actually designed mankind to to be unconditionally loved and so the mother fulfills a lot of that function by nurturing the child and as a result of that meeting the child's basic needs and recognizing the specific way a child needs to feel loved and and as we know not everybody's got the same love language <laughs> you know what what works for the one doesn't necessarily work for the other one and so a mother's role is to really discern what is going to make this child feel loved and meet that need so we're not going to go into all that now but um that's, that's something that we'll also look into at another session. So what happens is if that nurturing side is met, when the young child grows up, and I'm talking specifically about boys in this instance, they learn, as I said, to self-nurture. And when they have problems in life, there's exams or there's peer pressure, bullying, or maybe later on they come into marriage and there's problems in the marriage or maybe the wife is going through a crisis the man has built in an ability how to deal with that stress and he can self-nurture and he's not needing something from the wife at that point and often that um, that is so helpful because most rela relationships in fact there's 75 to 85 percent of marriages that are codependent and the codependency codependency is often caused by the child not being 
child's emotional needs not being met when young. So often a child is stunted in that area, they grow up and they get into unhealthy relationships or they get into maybe smoking, gangs, drugs, they're looking to identify somewhere. And um, so, yeah, so, so the mother's role is very important in helping that and preventing the codependency. So what happens in cycles of codependency is when the, um, if the wheels fall off for the wife, the husband reacts in anger, and then the wife in fear, and then you've got a whole cycle where the emotional well-being of the wife is dependent on the husband's response and vice versa. And um, unfortunately that cycle is really um, prevalent in society where there isn't um, a stable home environment where children grow up feeling, um, being well uh, nurtured from little so what happens with the father, his role is equally important right from birth. There's certain areas like for instance in a girl, she gets a lot of her sense of value, especially in her sexuality as a girl. When she gets to about maybe close to 11, 12, often she develops this closeness to her father where she's starting to draw her sense of how how do I relate in a situation um, to the male world? And somehow her father starts to validate her femininity. He he, to him, it's so important that he's, he will speak to her words like, you are the most beautiful princess, there is nobody like you in the world. And to really affirm her in that place of her identity, to value her, just to speak life into her heart which really builds up her sense of value of herself. And so often if a young girl has had that wonderful affirmation from her father, she grows up and often she doesn't even need a boyfriend until such time as the right young man comes along. And even then, she's not looking for something she's already been validated in by her father. Already her sexuality in a sense has been validated and affirmed by a father's um, affirming words that he speaks over her, his involvement in her life, and just the whole positive influence he's got towards her. And um, so when she does meet her partner, there's just a healthy interdependence, interdependency in the relationship. It's not an unnatural, unhealthy, where she's still trying to find something her father didn't give her, which actually puts incredible pressure on the man because it's like a sinking hole, he just cannot fill it. And so, um, and as a result, he becomes stuck in the sinking sand and he's, she, she's been pulling him down and then they each start pulling each other down. So, yeah, and so what happens is in terms of the, the son's situation, the father builds in an incredible sense of um, direction for the boy, uh, brings into him a stability and identity, envisions him, and all of this is really done by a father calling out who the young boy is. And often it's just by really being interactive, being involved in the young boy's development, standing with him, protecting him when he needs protection. Maybe it's from uh, bullying, maybe it's from just um, things that, um, situations that happen, maybe it's just an accident or a fall that he has where he sees his father run to him <laughs> and grab him and lift him up and kiss him all over and really make him feel like he is loved. And often fathers battle with that because the emotional side in their own life um, hasn't often been seen to attend to either by absent mother and or perhaps an absent father where one or the other and sometimes in extreme cases neither of those areas have been fulfilled properly and what happens is you have a young boy who has not been nurtured he has not been validated his identity has not been called out by a father he's um, so emotionally he's pretty much dysfunctional 
In other words, he's, um, a lot of his building blocks aren't in place. And so when he gets to adulthood, now he needs to start coping with pressures of exams at school and later on um, friends, peer pressure, uh, pressures at work and, made, and later on in marriage. And he just does not have the infrastructure. It's like those building blocks just aren't there. And um, it's like at some point this building is just going to collapse. Uh, there'll be burnout. So often what happens with, with people when they get to, um, as they grow up and develop, there's been so much lack with all these building blocks not being there in place. So when the pressures of school comes along, when the pressures of um, not being able to cope, not fitting in, not having the emotional infrastructure, the stability that parents build into a child's infrastructure, both the mother's nurturing hearts and the father's carrying the visionary, carrying out the um, modeling role, carrying the whole um, releasing into manhood um, sort of function and he activates the son into a place of um, leadership and calling out his, um, his giftings, talents <clears throat> and affirming him in his true identity with those <coughs> sorry, building blocks that have not been in place often the young man cannot cope with the pressures of stress in his work environment he cannot cope with relational issues with his partner and often that building, the, the building starts to come down and basically the foundations that were not put in their properly, proper place in parenting um, starts to, to be exposed. Often young children when they haven't had this type of um, infrastructure put in place they start to find the identity elsewhere. So we when, when um, there was a time a couple of years we were looking after some young boys and um, we spent a couple of years just taking them on little outings on weekends and we take them to the beach and just on certain outings and I really loved watching the, the one young boy, he was from 6 until about 12 he used to watch Gunter, he used to walk like Gunter, he used to watch him drive and I could see in his mind there was like this whole sense of modelling that there was something being built into his infrastructure that he was modelling this type of behaviour and fortunately that was good behaviour and so young people there is something in them that is constantly looking to, to model after there's something that God has put in the heart of us all. Like little Simba when he went to the waters of reflection and he saw his father's face. There's something in us that is looking to model after somebody for identity. And so when that isn't those building blocks aren't put in place properly, these children start to look to their peers. They, they often, um, young boys in communities, often will look to gangs. They'll look to pleasing their friends and they'll go with whatever the friends are being involved in. Girls as well, they, if they haven't had that nurturing properly by a father, the affirming love of the father, they're going to be looking for it somewhere. Hard to get love and at whatever expense, whether it's really selling themselves short of, their, um, of um, their, who they are or could be as, as young girls. Um, they will stop at nothing. There's something God has put in us to really um, have an identity. And if the right identity isn't put there, which comes from parents, but ultimately, first of all, from God, essentially from God, um, the children or the, the young um, um, boy or girl will actually be looking for it somewhere else. And unfortunately, Often there's just so much temptation around them that um, they end up in these cycles of codependency in these wrong relationships and often the dependency goes into drugs, drinking, sex, money, stealing and that goes into a whole lot of dynamics. So 
Yeah, we, we're looking at, we're talking about unconditional love. We are born into a society that is very performance based. So, as I mentioned earlier, our bodies are designed for unconditional love and to be loved unconditionally. And if this deep need is not met in our, um, in, in our parenting um, place, there is a huge gap. And so the way society is, if, if those children haven't had a proper sense of being valued and loved unconditionally, they are going to battle to cope in a performance-based society. And so where school can be a very positive environment for children that have a very good foundation, a stable environment, they can cope even if they're not necessary children who perform well with routine and um, structure. There's enough of a stability and an infrastructure where the parenting can bring the balance of maybe the other aspects of who the child is and what the child needs to develop and to grow and mature, the parents can step in and, and balance that lack. But unfortunately, a lot of um, the school system uh, does cater for children that are more inclined towards task, routine and structure which um, leaves a large portion of children that are um, maybe children that are more motivated by having freedom to develop creatively or through play or drama in other expressions and don't necessarily fit into the whole structure of things but that does not necessarily mean to say they're not bright. These children often are equally if not in some ways more bright, but often that um, the school's system don't always have the capacity to cater for all the different diverse types of expressions of um, how these children um, need to be taught or maybe um, what is healthy in the individual um, needs to develop and so um, this is more and more accentuated or the, the severity of this where there's um, lack and dysfunction in the family home and so this is where we are seeing the real pressure for educators and principals. This is where the, the burden and the pressures of the lack in the homes of the families that you as educators and principals are trying to educate, direct and train these children who are in many, many, many of them, possibly 75, 50 to 75% of them are in some sort of dysfunctional homes environment. And so the joy, so the, the capacity of the educators and principals are really um, utilized to the fullest. And this is where often burnout can occur um, with, within the educators' own environment, own life. So, yeah, just what we've been doing up until now is really just giving you an understanding of what the circumstances are, what the situation is, and what the problem really is. And so where we would really like to assist is how do we move forward from this, knowing that these are the dynamics of what you as educators are facing, um, what the children are, are experiencing, what is the best way forward.